So, so statutes have no effect in the real world until they're interpreted and applied by courts. And here's the thing. It's not unusual for courts to read language into and out of statutes. So interpret a statute as if it included words that were not there or interpret a statute as if words that are there don't have any meaning and should just be ignored. And that law, that interpretation of the statute is just as valid law as the statute itself. In fact, it's more controlling than the apparent plain English reading of the statute because it defines what the statute really means. So two ways for laws to be created, right? Let's set aside constitutional matters. Uh, there's bills become laws by the legislature. That's one way, statutory law. The second way is case law. These interpretations and decisions by the appellate courts. And that's just as valid as law created by the legislature. In fact, it defines what the legislature statutes actually mean. So the statutes passed by the legislature don't mean what the legislature meant them to mean or hoped they would mean or wished they would mean or intended them to mean those statutes mean what the courts say they mean period so if you're reading statutory law and it seems plain enough to you and you constrain your conduct within the boundaries of that statutory law you may or may not be acting lawfully because the actual legal boundaries are not what the statute appears to say. The actual legal boundaries are what the courts that interpret that statute say they are. So you could be within the plain English reading of a statute and be outside the legal scope of that statute per the interpretation of the courts. So if all you've done is read the statutes and you haven't looked at the court decisions that interpret and apply those statutes, you don't really know what those statutes mean. You just don't. And we have an example of this from California. So the kind of the background here is that there was a California homeowner and uh, he'd had um, not a very wealthy person, didn't have a lot of stuff, didn't have a lot of property, had a home and people were breaking into his home when he wasn't there typically. Uh, and a couple of youths were using burglary tools to break into his home. And one of them got shot in the face. And the question was, was this use of defensive force at the time this occurred? This was in the early 1970s. Was that use of force lawful? The use of deadly defensive force to shoot that attempted burglar in the face, who was making an unlawful and forcible entry into the home, or at least uh, attempting to do so. And the homeowner's defense was essentially, well, I, I don't even have to argue that I was defending my home. I can just argue self-defense because the California self-defense statute, it's plain English reading says I'm allowed to use deadly defensive force under these circumstances. When someone's making a surprise, a surreptitious entry into my home, guess what? That didn't work out well for him. Now, there is a, uh, an, another very interesting wrinkle to this case. It's a separate set of legal issues from what I just discussed, um, the, the homeowner's justification for the use of force. Um, and so I don't want you to confuse the two. It's very common for people to look at a, a case that involves distinct issues and blend them all together, conflate them all together. And it just, it just, it leads to poor legal understanding and legal analysis. So it's important you understand these, these, this issue, this first issue I raised that the plain English reading of the statute allegedly justified the homeowner's use of deadly force. That's one issue. A second set of issues that we'll talk about just because they're so interesting from a historical context is that the homeowner didn't actually fire the shot himself. He set a trap, what might be called a spring trap where someone opens a window or opens a door, there's a string that goes to the trigger of a firearm. Uh, in this case, that firearm was triggered by the burglars while the homeowner was away from home. Now, the, the, the defendant's argument here is that none of that matters because I'm allowed to do anything remotely that I would have been allowed to do had I been personally present. So if it would have been lawful for me to fire the shot in person, and I'm claiming it is under the plain English language of the, the homicide statute and California law, justified homicide, um, then it's lawful for me to do it by a remote device. But two separate arguments, right? One is, uh, was it lawful at all to use deadly defensive force 
in those circumstances under then existing California law. And the other is, the other is, um, if it is lawful to fire the shot yourself, would it also be lawful to do it with a remote device, with a trap, a booby trap, essentially? 